welcome to tonight's episode of Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel, and as always, I have a very special guest for you, Dr. Suzanne Greenwich, who's the founder and CEO of Woman to Woman OBGYN. She'll be with us for the next 30 minutes, so stay with us. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV, where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel. And like I said, I have a very special guest for you, Dr. Suzanne Greenwich, who's the founder and CEO of Woman to Woman OBGYN. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Lydia. I love to be here. Well, we again. love having you here again. again. No stranger. Great. <laughs> Definitely have a, a seat here anytime at Beyond Focus because you bring so much great information. So we love having you here. Great. But tonight, like, well, last time, just to recap, we had you here for the book. Mm -hmm. um, Black, pregnant, and loving it. Black, pregnant, and loving it. Okay, but now we're here just to talk about OBGYN and what you really do as a doctor, which is so important to the community. So mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a great episode. So just kind of recap, you know, what your role is as OBGYN. Well, as an obstetrician gynecologist, I do deliveries, of course. That's the main thing that everyone thinks of when they think of OBGYN. I still do deliveries, which includes normal deliveries, as well as cesarean sections. And as the gynecologist part, I am a little special in that I'm also uh, not only a gynecologist, but also a gynecological surgeon as well. Wow. So I deal with uh, normal routine uh, gynecology, checking, doing pap smears, annuals, um, looking for pathologies, taking care of patients with fibroids. Uh, but then once I do find uh, problems that women have, what most I enjoy is actually solving the problems. That's so amazing. I love doing surgery and I take care, I do hysterectomies, I do robotic surgery, so I operate with a robot as well as a lot of laparoscopic surgery or minimally invasive surgery, we also call it as well. That's amazing. Kind of let's backtrack a little bit because <laughs> you do robotic surgery and that's actually yeah. something that's not found in all clinics, of course, in New York. It's, it exists and it's very known, but kind of go into that. So you actually have a robot working with you. Yes, I operate uh, with the Da Vinci robot and that robot is um, hooked to the patient and I'm actually away from the patient's bedside when I'm doing the surgery. So what happens is I operate through a console, I'm looking into a console and I'm actually controlling the robot as the robot is over the body. Um, the advantages of being a robotic surgeon is we have a lot of uh, precision, we're able to see very well, we can go up very close with the anatomy and see what's, what's happening as well as controlling. I have good control of my instruments when, when I'm in the uh, console of the Da Vinci robot as well. So you're very much for it? Very much for it, yes. Okay. Because, you know, some people are still a little bit scared. There's mm -hmm. the naysayers who are like, oh, I don't want a robot working on me. But there's a lot of good that actually comes from that. And knowing that you actually do control it is, yes. I think, a very big Actually, big yes. We, we definitely control the robot. Um, and, you know, I've been doing it for over a year now. And, um, you know, most of my patients are very happy that I'm actually using the robot because they understand the benefits. Um, less pain. Uh, when you're doing the surgery with the robot because of the way the trocars are placed. Uh, when patients are done with the surgery, they're very happy. So I have a lot of my patients who had surgery talk to other patients of mine who are very nervous um, and able to tell them about their experience and make them feel comfortable. So how are, describe when they actually wake up from surgery and they, they realize they just had a robot operate on them, but the, it's a success rate. Do they still kind of feel like, wow, I really just had a robot operating on You know, on me. they are more happy with the fact that the surgery went well. They don't really focus on the robot because the robot is just a tool. I could actually do the surgery without the robot. Um, but knowing that I'm very comfortable <coughs> using it and that it's going to be better for them in terms of my precision and what I'm able to do. For example, when women have cysts, I'm able actually really to peel away the cysts better 
than if I'm doing a straight stick laparoscopy. Um, I can actually, because it's kind of like having hands in the belly. So with those hands, I can actually really get in there and actually take out what I need to take out and leave what I'm supposed to leave. So That's amazing. they're just happy that the surgery went well and that they're doing great and everything's going you know, really good at That's the surgery. Awesome. So years ago when you're going through medical school, what really led you to choose obstetrician? as your focal point? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, well, definitely it started from my sister was, I was, when I was seven years old, I had, I have a sister that was born with uh, hydrocephalus. So she had water on her uh, brain and it wasn't detected right away. Um, so I remember her getting emergency surgery and, and then I realized that it, she wound up having brain damage as a result. And my mother never had a sonogram. Um, at that time, so that always stuck with me. So I always said, you know, I think I may, I think the Cosby's also had something to do with it, watching the Cosby show and mm -hmm. seeing him. Um, but I, I always had in my head that, you know what, that kind of that OB thing was kind of pretty cool. But I actually almost became an orthopedic surgeon. Um, okay. Yeah, when I went to downstate, I actually was on the track to go into orthopedics. And at the last minute, I decided, no, I think. OBGYN is really where I need to be. Right. So you mm -hmm. made that decision. So I made that ultimate decision and very happy with the decision that I made in life. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. it's great. You know, you've done a lot of great things. You actually, you know, have your own practice. So let's kind of talk about that. You mm -hmm. know, woman to woman. Yes. Woman in to Westchester. Woman. woman to woman, OBGYN in Westchester and Bronx as well. And it's a um, multi-center. We have uh, multiple uh, practitioners that work at the center and we're all women which is kind of nice um, so if you come to woman to woman you would only get a woman there because we don't have men working hence the name woman to woman OBGYN right. and that started from uh, years ago well, maybe about 20 something years ago I used to have the patients I, I was actually with another male um, uh, partner and they kept saying you know uh, Doc, I just, I just want you. I, I just want a woman. I want that woman. And I was like, you want the woman to woman thing? And they said, yeah. And hence the name, woman, woman to woman. woman. And that's how it started by a lot of my patients just wanting just a woman. And I said, oh, this is a nice little niche that I could create by making a practice that tells the name of what we do. So we I actually really like that because mm -hmm. for myself, I personally just for that field of stuff I prefer to have a female yeah and you know I've pulled a couple people some people no preference other people do have what they would like yeah I kind of prefer just having a woman because not that men can't relate mm -hmm. but you could actually discuss certain things and right. describe certain things I mean I could be describing it to him and he may know the symptoms on paper but he would never understand. Yeah, there's a certain specialness with there having is. a woman. I, although I've gone to men uh, gynecologists, and I think men are great too. Absolutely. Um, but I think we f we fill a niche. Uh, sometimes it's religious um, that that That's women true. just want women um, in the Muslim uh, community. Um, they do not want a man around. So uh, we have a lot of women who come to our practice because they know that they're only going to have a woman that takes care of them. So um, we do feel fill a niche in society um, being all women's practice and we're very happy to fill that niche. It's not for everyone. I'm finding the younger populations are very comfortable with women. Uh, some of the older populations still uh, feel that, mm -hmm. that, you know, men, but they, they're like, some of them are like, well, I'll try the woman and see how, how it goes. Exactly. So when they come, they are ple pleasantly surprised and quite happy that they did decide to switch and, and come to us. So it is That's wonderful to be able to great. provide that for alternative for, for other women. Absolutely. We'll hold that thought. We'll take a quick break. You'll be right back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel having a great conversation here with Dr. Suzanne Greenwich. So Dr. Greenwich, we're talking about, you know, so many great things and about mm. really that like you're saying offline in your field when you came in, it was still pretty male dominated. Oh, yeah, totally male dominated. Um, I actually was, um, you know, one of very few. I think there was uh, 16 of us four in each year and I think there were only three women or four women in, in our group and that was it. So when I came in it was very male dominated so it was quite common for older women to want to be a male gynecologist because that's all they knew. Um, this true. whole new woman thing has happened in the last you know I don't know 20 years or so that women have now flooded flocked to the field and have kind of taken over a little bit in terms of uh, like balancing it, it out. Yeah, I, I do bit. like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think it's great to have that option available. And it really does make for something great. Yeah. Um, but a topic I kind of wanted to talk about for a lot of us younger ladies mm -hmm. or the, the 35 under category who are still working professionals, but we haven't found a partner and we may want to consider freezing our eggs. Yes. Kind of, so let's talk Wonderful. about that. That's yeah. a big thing. You know, you hear a lot about it mm -hmm. and you don't have to just wait till you're potentially sick to do it. This is something you could just willingly go and, and do. Right, yeah. Freezing eggs uh, is something that I think we need to talk more about. We talk about men um, donating sperm. Uh, you know, sometimes when men are in college, they donate their sperm for money. For money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we do have young women uh, donating eggs now. We haven't talked about that, but uh, there are young women uh, that can donate for couples who... Um, are having trouble getting pregnant um, and and need eggs. Uh, there they do. They, we have younger population, do, but more importantly, I think women should think about donating for themselves. Uh, it's kind of like having an insurance policy that you kind of put the eggs in a bank, and if you need them down the road, mm -hmm. you have them. So we probably should have um, you know talk about this a little bit more, and women should know that this is an option. I have talked about it with a number of my patients, and a few of them have went out and did it, and I was surprised. They came back and said, "I did it." I said, "Really? You did it?" They said, "Yes, I donated. I have ten um, eggs in the bank." And if I ever need them, they're right there. So I think it's a wonderful thing. So when you donate your eggs, though, that doesn't guarantee that that batch of 10 will amount to a baby. Right. Like, let's say I freeze, I decide to go ahead and freeze my eggs. I freeze 10 of them. Five years from now, I want to go ahead and use them. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that I will get pregnant using those um, eggs? Uh, you have a good chance. And, and one of the benefits is that will be your only option if you aren't able to produce eggs anymore. So they are getting, the fertility uh, centers are very good at unfreezing them. And they do a process that doesn't damage them so much. So that at that time when you have a husband or a partner that you would like to impregnate that egg, they can put the sperm there and they can fertilize those eggs. And that's why if you, the more you have, the more chances that you will get a pregnancy um, out of that batch that you've saved. So, and, and it's, it's insurance. So therefore you don't it really need is. it. If, if you don't need it, you don't use it. But if you need it, meaning if you went through premature menopause and you don't have any eggs anymore, you're not able to produce, you can say, oh, I have this batch that I, I stored, so let's go in and freeze some of them and try to get um, a pregnancy out of that. And I think that's great, and a lot of people in our community, I don't think this is as talked about as yeah. much as it really should. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of left more for the elite and those who could afford it and yes. you know certain people but in our community especially with a lot of black women who get fibroids and have to go through surgeries sometimes mm -hmm. I think this is a very viable option yeah and I think it should be discussed more and and brought out there so it's a it's not a painful process no I mean basically it's a two-week process where you get injections and you're able you're stimulated to make a lot more eggs and um, after the, about two weeks, uh, they trigger you. And once they trigger you, they then do a minor surgery uh, going through your vagina where they retrieve those eggs. And hopefully, you know, it's a huge batch and some will go through the process and survive and others won't. And then you'll wind up with a certain number of quality eggs mm -hmm. that they can say, listen, these eggs.